Okay, uh, unfortunately we have to start. Please uh, take your seats. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to um, welcome you for the last panel for today. Uh, and I hand over to Jason Lustig, uh, who is coming uh, to us from UCLA and will introduce himself. Good afternoon, everybody. Those of you who you know have made it through the day, uh, kudos. Um, we uh, um, we have um, for today's final panel a very exciting uh, discussion. Um, first, briefly, um, my name is Jason Lustig. I teach uh, Jewish history at UCLA, uh, and um, and we have joining us uh, um, a number of uh, people who are working on some very exciting projects. Uh, you know, we have uh, Kia Hayes uh, from the Shoah Foundation, uh, Noah Schenker from uh, Monash University, uh, and Dan Leppard from uh, St. Mary's College of California, um, and then also Stephen Smith, also from the Shoah Foundation, is going to uh, to sort of finish us off uh, today. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, we we still have coffee over there. I don't think it's run out just yet. Um, anyway, um, so. Um, uh, Kia is going to give a very, a relatively short presentation. I'm just going to say a quick word to introduce her. Uh, she is the program manager of uh, New Dimensions in Testimony. Uh, Kia joined the Shoah Foundation uh, a bit over four years ago after earning her master's in public diplomacy from the USC Annenberg School of Communications. Uh, her work at the Shoah Foundation began with academic programs, and in, 20, in 2014, she joined the New Dimensions and Testimony team uh, as the first interview with Pinchas Guter uh, as it was wrapping up, and the pilot NDT exhibit was being built. Uh, she's helped complete all the remaining interviews for NDT, including one in Hebrew and one in Mandarin, and has demonstrated NDT internationally and is now responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the program and its growth. And uh, she's going to speak briefly about this program uh, and introduce the, uh, the New Dimensions in Testimony program uh, and introduce us to our special guest as well. Hi guys, let me know if you can't hear me. I have a, a low voice and I know I'm over in the corner. Um, I'm going to make this fairly quick. I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to Pincus and New Dimensions in Testimony. Really quick question, who has had a chance today to interact with Pincus? Okay, good, who has had a chance in general to interact with Pincus or any of the other survivors. Okay, great. So Pincus is one of 16 survivors we've now filmed this way. Uh, we filmed them for about a week. We ask somewhere around 1,000 questions. Then we have a software system where a user can go up and ask their own question. They'll get a response that was a response that they gave during that interview. Um, so I'm gonna start by asking him a handful of questions and then we'll jump into the discussion. Hello? Hi. Can you guys all hear him? Yeah. How are you? Please repeat that. How are you? Uh, reasonably well. <laughs> Can we ask you some questions today? Okay, go ahead. Where are you from? I come from Poland, a country in Eastern Europe. in a place called, the town was called Łódź, but I lived with my family before the war. And during the war, I lived in the capital of Poland, Warsaw. What happened to you during the Holocaust? Uh, during the Holocaust, I first lived for the first couple of months after the war started in my hometown in Łódź. And then we, went as Polish Christians, because Jews weren't allowed to use the trains anymore, uh, at the end of 1939 to Warsaw to stay with an aunt of mine. And for the rest of, until the middle of 1943, until, until May of 1943, I lived first outside the ghetto, because the ghetto wasn't formed until the end of 1940, and for about two and a half years, I lived inside the Warsaw Ghetto. And of course, after that, I was sent to concentration camp. And how old are you? I was born in 1932, so you can make your own arithmetic. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you for coming. 
Thank you for listening to me patiently. Okay, so that's a quick demo, and I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the panel. Thank you, Kia. Um, so we can talk a bit more about that as we sort of talk, get to a QA and a um, at the end of the panel. Um, we, uh, we have next a, uh, a presentation uh, by Noah Schenker and Dan Leppard um, about the uh, virtual Holocaust survivor as an embodied archive. And uh, Dan is going to speak first. Uh, he is Associate Professor of Media and Visual Studies at St. Mary's College of California. And his publications include essays in Cinema Journal, Television and New Media, Convergence Media History, and Joystick Soldiers, The Politics of Play in Military Video Games. His book, Teaching with the Screen, Pedagogy, Agency, and Media Culture, is available from Routledge. And he is currently working on a visual history of the reciprocal relationships between psychological theory and screen-based media across the 20th century. So. And then I, I guess I'll introduce Noah as well, because he's going to jump in um, in a little bit. Um, Noah is the 6A Foundation and N. Milgram Senior Lecturer in Holocaust and Genocide Studies within the Australian Center for Jewish Civilization at Monash University. His research and teaching specialization traverse the fields of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Trauma and Memory Studies, and Film and Media Studies. His most recent publications include his monograph, Reframing Holocaust Testimony from 2015, and Through the Lens of the Shoah, The Holocaust as a Paradigm for Documenting Genocide Testimonies in History and Memory from 2016. So, so I, I, want, I, want, I want to start by, so I'm a little bit of the oddball out in this particular setting. I feel like the entire day we've had sort of um, empirical work being shown, even though there was some, a lot of talk about qualitative work. Um, but I come to this as a media scholar, and I also come to it as a former filmmaker, and you'll see in a second, as a, form, f f as a cartoonist. That was my starting point. So I'm really, and how did I get to Pincus? And what I want to say is, I've lived in two families, one that was affected by the Holocaust, and, and currently one that was affected by the Japanese internment. And I, you know, so I, I, I We've done a lot of reading and talking about post-memory and the idea of this transferal of trauma across generations. And I'm really interested in the way that sort of notions of trauma map onto personal traumas that are not necessarily associated with the sort of event trauma, that, the kind of things we look at. Um, I could get into more details of that, about that. But um, So I also have very interest in how we treat him as a human. And I've done a lot of work around pedagogical agents, um, sort of forerunners of this particular uh, gentleman. Um, through the ICT, which is the Institute for Creative Technologies here at USC. Um, I'm really interested in the way that these pedagogical agents work in the sort of setting of either uh, educational or, or, or non-educational settings. And through that work, I came more and more in, became more and more interested in cognitive science. And a, oddly enough, through cognitive science, I became more and more interested in psychoanalysis as a critique of cognitive science and a, a way of sort of understanding a, a sort of what I see as a split across the 20th century, moving from a um, psychoanalytic perspective as a sort of notion of public understanding of consciousness to the current one that you know, starts back in the 80s, uh, emergent work from the 50s, et cetera, um, around cognitive science. So that's how I come to him. Um, I'm also very interested in trauma studies, as I said, but I'm also very interested in visual research methodologies, ones that are much more atypical. I, I, earlier when somebody mentioned visualization, um, you know, my own background, I think, well, there's visualization and then there's visualization. So, so in honor of this moment, and, and we've been, I can consider the work we're doing actually a dialogue between Noah and I. My interest is actually in the way that World War I influenced representations after that event obviously affected Freud, um, that those sort of um, cultural objects have sort of transmitted down the generations across um, the 20th century. So in honor of that, I made up this, I was gonna say, it looks like there's enough people. I was gonna say I don't have enough copies, but so it's a limited edition handout, but actually it turns out maybe, maybe there's plenty of copies. Anyway, so if you could pass this around. It's essentially, it's essentially a comic book I made as a handout. It goes with the slideshow. And it, and it really is like, it, it's, it's like a lot of people are talking about their work as being sort of like ongoing project. This is something I'm really interested in. Um, again, because my sort of latent uh, cartooning abilities from the past, I sort of feel like there's other ways to handle subjectivity in a way that's very visual and also um, very much engages with the subjectivity of the object you're looking at. So I've done a lot of work around the way in which we sort of afford um, human traits to non-human objects. And so this is actually my attempt to start working on the, that kind of material. 
Um, anyway, so you can read it at your leisure as you're going. It, it kind of works with the slideshow I have here. This is myself. This is Noah. So it's essentially a bit of a, a bit of a, um, a bit of a sleight of hand how to read a virtual human. It's actually not particularly semiotic, but I do think there are ways to understand these objects. In a, you know, we have Pingus here, but I also see that there's um, certain ideas that float around these objects. Um, one of them being the uncanny valley, which I think you're all familiar with. What I'm interested in is the, the and you know, the idea of the uncanny valley is the closer you approximate a human representation and not totally represent it in like in photograph, that it actually has an uncanny quality Freud, right? The idea of the familiar yet the unfamiliar, the discomforting. And of course those objects have moved throughout the 20th century, most notably in horror films, but also in war films, those kind of things. And so, you know, my interest in it is, you know, like Anna, An Anomalisa. So the idea of like trying to look at these, these objects in a, in a subjective space, and by the way, I was gonna have color in this, but I haven't quite managed to get there either, but because everybody likes color. Um, but anyway, so I'm interested in the, the dead eye look, the, you know, and again, Pincus is much more visually representational of human. But I, what I'm really interested in is still there's stoppages and again, it's, it's, you know, it's a technology. I, one, of the, one of the quotes that's in my book from the ICT people is, you know, there's a horizon of the technological, it's, let's call it the sublime, where there'll be a transparency between the technology and us. So you'll be able to actually converse with somebody. But at the moment, we're not quite there. And even in this, you can see the edits, you can see the shifts. And the, so the, the consciousness is still in the realm of the uncanny, right? Like we, we're listening, so any individual chunk of data is actually specifically human. But the interstitial moments between those moments, and also, I, you know, I don't know if you get the way I talk, but I have never been able to make Pincus understand me. I just don't. <laughs> There's something about my speech patterns he just doesn't get. So it's constantly a disruptive process of trying to get to the right vocal pattern and train myself to basically work with him. On the other hand is, the, a couple of times, the one that really worked was I said, what's the most vivid memory you have? And he picked up on this amazing story about wheelbarrows in the Warsaw Ghetto, and it was, it was an entrancing moment, but then the, the moment ended and we went back to the sort of puzzle mode which he's in right now. Um, so the, what I'm trying to look at him in the sort of structure around automata, and the way that these things have been, they have a long history, which you know, you got a few dates on there. Um, you know, and I see him as part of this, sort of systemizing of sort of the human. And I, I, I actually don't see it as a negative. If you read the comic, it might seem like it's a critique, specifically a critique. Well, there's a critique in there, but it's actually also, there's an idea that we've been trying to replicate biological processes since the beginning of time. There's all sorts of narrative stories and stuff. And here's another iteration. I kind of see this as a huge improvement over previous versions I've seen, there's um, psychoanalysts, there's psychotherapists, there's a, a, a interactive agent that deals with kids with cancer. And again, they all vary in their, their relationship to the human. Some of them are much more cartoon based, the kids with cancer one, it sort of sets a sort of low stress level. Other ones are, are, are there's, there's one character who, who did a, a tra trains you to, do a sub to run a submarine, he has no legs because at that particular moment, the, the, the rendering of the legs were beyond the computational power of the actual hardware, right? So, you know, he's on even closer to the horizon, right? Um, so the idea of this, you know, the duck, right? And I love the fact is the original, this famous duck, which is one of the er earliest versions of, of artificial life, is to crap. Right? I mean, it's the idea that we're going to, the duck's going to eat something, you know, so fundamental to our base notion of what it is to be, exist as a being, right? And at the end of it, it drops out this little pellet, which if you see on there, it was kind of almost like a slide sh sideshow thing. It had a trick notion. And I'm kind of actually attempting to counteract, which some people have criticized, and again, I'm not in the community that seems to do the criticizing, but criticize pink as being almost like a parlor trick or a, you know, what is it? A, um, what is it, um, what's the ghost? Pepper's ghost, you know, an illusion of some kind, a cinema of attractions. And yes, there is that to it. But also, you know, there's this actual human being who exists in the world. And at some point that human being will cease to exist and which is part of the reason why this is being created. But that person still has a sort of, as we all know, has a sort of event horizon of their own, with, which is their, their biography, right? And so what I'm really interested in is sort of exploring in a sort of narrative framework, which I, to be honest, I used to do ethnography. I still do ethnography of sense, but I got really frustrated with text. 
simple text because I was really interested in the way in which visuals can sort of explain things in ways that text can't. And I found myself writing lots of stuff that was very much about visuals. And I found the more and more I find that like there's a certain, again, the subjectivity of myself in the encounter with the object. And that's what I sort of see, since it's all about the encounter, that the idea of pink is existing in this sort of relational space, which we talked about before, was phenomenological. And, but there's still an apparatus involved. There's still the distancing of the figure. There, there was, um, there's a whole um, project that was called Flat World, which was soldiers and a sort of Iraq, kind of, they always denied it was Iraq, but Iraq set, setting. And the soldiers would, would be on these sort of frames that are as, as a, the height of you, you know, a real size person, and they would basically be talking to you. But there's still the, the structural idea of what is possible for the user to say. And then a lot of the issues we've been listening to about the idea of the database and the keyword search and the, 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 the quality of that search um, factors into the humanness of this object. And so I'm really interested in looking that, at that, the human in relation to the non-human. And um, that's pretty much my, my spiel. I'll read the comic when you get a chance. You can take it with you, limited edition. I can say that I contributed nothing to the cartoons. Uh, it would have been indecipherable. Um, the first time I actually encountered Pincus was neither in this form um, nor in the cartoon form, but in the kind of 1995 video testimony they gave to the Shoah Foundation. And I recall um, in Pincus's comments in that testimony when he says, quote, oh, where are we on the uh, screen? So, Oh, right. Yeah. Where he became, <clears throat> where he says, I find it difficult, and this is him in 1995, I find it difficult to be a physical entity. I became a video machine, a recorder. So this description of him, of himself, as someone who was documenting, someone who became a documentary machine, a camera, uh, a recording device. And it's precisely his detailed videographic memory, if you will, that positions him as a reliable, seemingly objective witness, one who was above all else, recording in order to survive, and surviving in order to record. He looks back on his past with a large semblance of emotional and bodily remove, commenting that looking back, quote, is almost like filming it, unquote, and then in the process of filming his, quote, subconscious doesn't allow him to have those feelings. Unquote. Precisely, again, this notion of the objective witness and that the mo mode of performance of the sobriety of the objectivity of Pincus is something that makes him, in essence, a, a privileged witness of sorts for the Shoah Foundation and, and for others as someone who can be reliable. And this is a phenomenon that exists not only within the Shoah Foundation but within other archives, including the Holocaust Museum in D.C. Although there is, uh, and if you look at, I'm just gonna, this is just a picture of Pincus with himself um, and his wife in Toronto. Um, when I went to go see, um, when the Pincus uh, installation was done, uh, or placed at the Holocaust Museum in Washington in 2016, I went and um, did some field work there. And although there's a table and a chair placed directly in front of Pincus, as you can see in that image, with a button to activate a microphone to register questions. That button on that particular day had malfunctioned and users were required to click on a mouse to enter their query, thus in essence compromising some of the transparency of that interaction. And when the cursor appearing on the screen during the question and answer session, it was difficult to maintain precisely that illusion of transparency. And yet, in spite of some of the, and I hesitate to use the word failures, but glitches or ongoing kind of evolution of Pincus and the technical mediations of the NDT, there was something incredibly um, ritualistic and uh, quite moving about the encounters between the users of that testimony and Pincus, the nodding of the head as he listened, the eye contact that was maintained between most of the users and Pincus, and the, the kind of attentive listening that people like Dory Laub and others have often described in its relationship of one-to-one -one, uh, dyadic relationship between an interviewer and interviewee. And yet, I found myself um, noticing that the questions that were being asked of Pincus tended to relate to what were the most 
difficult experiences that you've had? What was the most traumatic experience that you had? That in the absence of curatorial context about Pincus's life, in the absence of the larger narrative of Pincus's life, there was an emphasis on, not on uh, historical questions, but more on the questions that would allow, uh, say, an amateur or someone who was unfamiliar with the Holocaust to inquire about his feelings, about his experiences, about the registers of his emotion. And so while the encounter with Pincus didn't fit exactly with Dory Laub's foundational description of the primary moment of testimony in which an interviewer is, quote, party to the creation of knowledge, I think the interface does replicate the effects, perhaps, the effects of that primary encounter. It creates some conditions, um, albeit distracted conditions, for those moments potentially of surprise, the chunks that may come that are a surprise and, and inevitably perhaps even a mistake, a failure of the system. When one asks what is the most traumatic experience, it may not in fact correlate with the uh, questions that were asked of Stephen Smith of Pincus Guter in the original testimony, or in the, I should say in the original encounter that was recorded for the NDT testimony. But I was uh, struck by at least this notion of what's been referred to as user-driven editing, the fact that the initiative has been moved from the agency of the survivor to the um, user-driven imperatives of, well, the user. That is that the notion of how Pincus operates is, as you see, Pincus is not speaking to us from start to finish. Um, Kia must ask a question or one must ask a question to trigger uh, Pincus into speech. We must know the password. Whereas in Dory Laub's conception of testimony, we must listen in order to hear the password, in order to hear, as Lawrence Lang would say, the subtext of their narrative. Here, it is not about active listening in that context because the triggering must come from us first in order to allow Pincus to speak. So what are the words that we will use to access the index of Pincus's experiences? Um, so I want to think about those things as we open the, uh, the floor to discussion, but I also want, um, because I think that there's something incredibly promising about this interface, and that's precisely, I think, the ways in which it generates, as I said, the effects, but also perhaps, uh, and I'm perhaps idealistic, some sort of kind of ethical relationship between the user, right, and uh, Pincus. To what extent can we use the cues, can we use the kind of physical register, and the fact that when I used Pincus for the first time in the company of Stephen Smith in 2016, I found myself transfixed, I found myself obligated to Pincus to listen to him. And there was something of, of a visceral charge that I felt. Uh, and I'm wanting to maintain that effective link, but also maintain some sort of critical inquiry into how Pincus is embodied here as a survivor, the way as, in which he may allow us to rehearse a testimonial encounter, and yet at the very same time, it is a, a testimonial encounter which is contingent upon the agency of the user, and an agency of a user which is often de decontextualized, right? That in many ways, what I found most striking is in my work on Holocaust testimony prior to even knowing about Pincus, prior to the conceptualization of Pincus, was the ways in which institutions, whether it's the Fortunoff Archive, the Holocaust Museum, or the Shoah Foundation, render into uh, bits of information, the ways in which they instrumentalize, in which they f focus on this particular survivor as opposed to this particular survivor. They extract this particular portion of a survivor's testimony to go on the website versus another aspect of the survivor's testimony. So too with Pincus, this idea of which aspects of Pincus's testimony become the most popular. And the more questions you ask of Pincus, the more, or I should say, the more popular a set of questions are, you're going to get, generate more answers along those lines of questions. Right? And so this idea that there's a continuity from the analog uh, to the digital, or from the video at least, to the digital, of being able to kind of segment his testimony, right? And to be able to break it down into bits of data, which ultimately privilege a certain kind of um, exemplary or dramatic set of circumstances opposed to the more boring, quote unquote, or the more peripheral aspects of testimony. I think these questions, though, drawing from my work on video testimony have migrated uh, to Pincus and I think are worthy of discussion to think about, well, 
is this notion of deep memory and common memory that Langer talks about? Is Mariana Hirsch's notion of post-memory? Are all these things need to be reconsidered in light of Pincus? Or is it essentially just a continuation of the same set of debates? And, and, and with that, I'd open up the floor uh, for your comments. So if we have any questions on this presentation, um, yes. So I was really struck, Noah, by your saying wh when I used Pincus for the first time. And a bit, no, no, just partly because it's not something we would say in a testimonial encounter standardly, right? We don't think in those terms in a conventional testimonial encounter. So I've got two questions, right? One is, is this testimony? And two, what is the ethical substructure at work here? I mean, in terms of your sense of what was required in order to make this real, what kinds of ethical considerations predominated, right? I mean, were there limits? Were there, what, were, what were those limits? Was Pincus consulted on those limits? Did he give consent? I mean, he consented to do this, obviously. <laughs> but was that consent given in the context of a clear statement of ethical responsibility and duty? In terms of the latter question, I could defer to Stephen Smith in terms of the nature of the, the contract between Stephen and Pincus in that matter, um, and the foundation more generally. But as far as the question of, as to whether or not this is testimony, certainly this is no less testimony than the 1995 video testimony of Pincus. I mean, because there's the pro I mean, testimony is process. It's not just what's captured on the videotape at that point. It's the phone call that's placed to discuss the backstory of a particular survivor before he or she even comes into the archive to give that testimony. Or it's the many iterations of Pincus's testimony giving testimony to, to communities, to students, before he even ever approaches the Shoah Foundation in 1994, 1995. So all testimony is in essence constituted by processes and segments which appear not in their entire duration as that which is recorded on the video, but that which is often falls into the floor as outtakes, right? In Cloud Lonsman's Shoah, or even in the outtakes of testimonies that don't make them, their way into transcripts. So I don't see why this is any... Now, what I do think is, so you can make choices, however, about how you could... You could make the choice to just have Pincus tell his story, or to have Stephen Smith's questions heard, right? You could have the voice of the interviewer, if you wanted, included in this process. I'm not saying that that's what I would suggest but you could have the voice of the interviewer. Would that make it more of a testimony? Or you could have Pincus just telling his story in its entirety, quote unquote, its entirety from start to finish. But again, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's a matter of how you use it, and it has the potential to be used as testimony, but it also has uh, the potential to be used as a, as a pedagogical agent, um, which, which Dan can talk about. But I don't think this is any less testimony than, a, than, a, than his video version in 1995. But you seem skeptical. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that shift in agency is really kind of crucial. I think in a standard testimonial encounter, the witness has, the, has, has much more agency than, than Pincus does in this context. And if nothing else, his relationship to his own utterances is rather different in this context than it would have been in a video context. Right. Whether or not that makes it not testimony or in something more maybe theatrical in this context, or being constrained to the limits of this context, whether that envisions an anthology of the testimony. Right. Well, with the, lar I could, with the larger, I mean, all, every interview, and I'm not even speaking about Pincus, but every interviewer or interviewee for the Shoah Foundation signs a consent form saying that they agree that their testimony will be used for variable purposes over time. Like, that's just a part of the standard contract. So um, there's already an acknowledgement and a, and a consent to segmentation that's built into that. And that's, by the way, true with many archives, so that's not unique. Um, but you're right in terms of agency, but that agency is still inscribed, right, within the act of, and I can't, sp I don't want to speak for Stephen, but Stephen's encounter with Pincus has its own contract, right? And then that contract migrates across different platforms, and you're right, the agency can get, s the, the reality of the agency that Pincus does have vis-a-vis -vis Stephen can get extracted and, and obscured and perhaps even effaced along the way, but it doesn't mean that it's not there in the initial, production, but what you're talking about is the effects and the reception. And I agree with you that that agency becomes 
potentially compromised in terms of its being given to us more than it's being given to him. And I do think that that is a legitimate line of critique where perhaps there's the illusion, well, go ahead. Oh no, I was only finished. Uh, where there, there is in fact, where there is, where, where I do think yes, there is too much focus on user agency at the expense of Pincus's agency. In its current iteration, I would agree with that. But it's still testimony. But I would also say from a documentary perspective, we, we watch all sorts of things that are documentary and we assume there's a certain agency on the part of the person, but yet they're edited all over the place. And obviously you don't have to go to reality TV to see that there's a fictive notion in relation to documentary. What strikes me is that, like I was trying to say in my presentation, is any given utterance retains the agency of the utterer. But the shifting, I mean, I, th I think the thing, is it troubling you that there's a sort of user, quote unquote, who, inter who kind of structures the knowledge as a response? No, I mean, or not? Like at the end of the day, I think my yeah. worry, and I don't know if it's a good worry, really, uh, but my worry is that when you can counter video testimony, you encounter, uh, every user will, or viewer will encounter the same testimony, whereas the interactions are going to vary with Pincus in this form in ways that make uh, multiple but there is a still a finite data set, right? Yeah. Right? I mean, you still have a finite set of what possibilities are there, right? Yeah. So I know, I know that there are a number of questions, and there's also going to be an opportunity at the end to have sort of a broader discussion about this project as a whole among all the panelists. So um, I know that there were some people who had some, their hands up before. Did, did you want to? Yeah. Thank you very much. So that's fine. So in a boring moment of my life, I turned on my iPad and I started to make a conversation with Siri. And uh, I ended up teasing Siri. And I'm not alone with this. This is a big topic on Google, Google teasing Siri and so on. And, and all it's about like playing with the, with the vulnerability of, of, of a virtual agent who cannot defend itself and so on. So don't you think that there is something like similar here in this case, that, that there is this person, but you, I can confuse him on purpose, for instance, or ask inappropriate questions and so on? Thank you. Uh, maybe if we can take another question as well so we can sort of group them together. Um, I'm not sure who. Oh. Um, oh. Hi, I'm Joanna Chen Chan. I'm from the UCLA Library. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I was curious, Noah, you mentioned that uh, the virtual survivor or Pincus didn't understand your accent and that that was a disruptive experience. That was, that was Dan. Oh, sorry, that was. Okay, Dan, I an sorry. I just have a odd speech um, so I'm curious about. What are your thoughts on how that might affect the testimonial encounter of people who might have heavier accents, and whether that'll dissuade people from those who uh, dissuade those who speak differently from feeling like they can engage or feeling like they might feel othered in not being understood in that question? And the second part of my question was um, just as a former archivist, I'm curious how, in using the term embodied archive, I'm curious if and how you think a more traditional archive of papers or images, collections, artifacts can help bridge that gap to history in terms of contextualizing history. So if you guys want to respond. Yeah. I was all ready for that first question. The second one totally <laughs> threw me off. Uh, you know, the first one I was going to say real quick is, you know, back to the you know, idea I was saying earlier about mapping traumas onto objects. Um, I have to say that you know, my few experiences with it was really frustrating. And I, I know from my own experience, um, looking at pedagogical agents, that interest level drops off quickly once a user is unable to sort of figure out the the key to operating with the the, ob the subject uh, that they're 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 d interacting with, and that's a problematic that I, I think sort of is replicated here. And again, if you so you train the user, and that's everything about pedagogical agency is that is you have to train the user to use the object. And and but one of the the things that keep you going is the humanity that is represented in the object, and that's a, a key to it. Or in the case of you know a cartoon character, the sort of you know the goofy aspects of humanity that are in court or career there, but somehow that's, so that, but I have to say it's extremely tra traumatic for me because it's from a speech impediment and it, it, all it does to me is register 
all the previous traumas of my inability to communicate with people. But it's not Pincus's fault. I mean, back to the notion of where he's at, right? It's, you know, so I mean, but the thing is, that still becomes a sort of viable, palpable reality for the user at some level. You answer that. Well, no, in terms of the other question, I, 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 I don't, I really don't, I mean, in terms of, the, I mean, l many, many analogies have been made between Siri and Pincus, which is completely erroneous, but um, I think the idea of, just as, just as the, the Memorial Berlin can become a, a place for, for transgression, so too Pincus can become a place for people to bring in their own kind of twisted notions of humor, I'm, but I, I don't really have anything yeah, else. I mean, the thing is, he, he, he doesn't respond. I mean, I, unless you guys will program something in there, but he, he doesn't respond. So really, it's a sort of one-way transmission, and it would only be in the context of the people in the room, which, by the way, would be like the showing Schindler's List in, in Oakland having the kids laugh at the, at, the, at the horrible atrocities, right? So, I mean, you've sort of got the same dynamic. So, you know, it isn't, I don't, I, well, I mean, I'm not sure how. He, he won't respond. I mean, if he says something, it'll be like... There is a kind of projection of intentionality. Right, but part of that intentionality in the sort of human interaction is the fact is the other eight, the other person in interaction is actually engaging with you with that behavior. Whereas this is really like it would be like either the puzzle mode or it would be a story that is tangential or something. And then you could laugh at that, but it, but it seems actually to me to me honestly it seems more foolproof than say the the mute stones that you can jump across and dance across. And by the way, very performative. Who knows what the reason is there? But right, I don't know. So I think we have time for one more set of questions before we have uh, Stephen's presentation. So, um, so Wolf and, uh, and yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Thomas. I'm a PhD candidate at UC San Diego. Uh, I wanted to follow up on something Dan just mentioned. Uh, I'm deeply interested in how we, how in the context of presenting this kind of presentation, how we explain it to the people who are coming up to interact with it. And I'm curious to know what, if any, what, what are the protocols that have been designed to, uh, to, to give to your staff, to give to the, the docents who are trained at museums on how to, how to lead people into this and say, here's how you interact with this, here's what this is, Here's the purpose of this, et cetera. If there's like a set of instructions or something like that. Yes, that would be me. And then just, yeah, I don't oh, okay. Uh, I had just um, a comment to Adam, actually, uh, because I, uh, Adam, Adam, <laughs> I wanted to comment on your uh, what you made as a distinction between how uh, everybody watches a uh, video testimony and it's the same, and this is very different. I would actually question this because we get, we start watching a testimony for with very different purposes. We often don't start uh, start watching at the beginning. Uh, we start in the middle. We go back and forth. So it's not the same watching what uh, everybody does uh, with the same testimony. And uh, there are, sometimes you see only a clip. So it, it's a very different experience. So I would actually uh, compare this with, with him. Uh, every user has a very individual experience of watching a testimony. Uh, yeah, so I guess I can address your question. So, so far we've done seven different pilots. The reason they're called pilots is because we are still using them to help evaluate what it will eventually look like in a more permanent contextualized museum exhibit. Um, the pilots do involve about two and a half, three days worth of training with all staff and volunteers that are going to facilitate the interactions. Um, right now it's at a place where you don't just leave Pincus on a monitor and people can walk up to them. It always has to be facilitated by a trained staff and that staff is trained by a member of, uh, or a staff member of USC Shoah Foundation. Um, and there are certain protocols that we follow. Uh, each pilot has informed the next though. So I think it's gone, it's, it's evolved and it will continue to evolve. Uh, and we're also doing a pretty robust monitoring and evaluation of not just the users, but also of the staff that are interacting with and facilitating the experience. Uh, so um, we're gonna have a chance to come back to this sort of in a larger sort of discussion, but um, 
I, I think Stephen um, is going to present now on, uh, on the topic of interactive Holocaust biography, literacy, memory, and history in the digital age. Uh, and just a quick word to introduce Stephen. Uh, uh, he is the Andrew J. and Erna uh, Finchie Viterbi Endowed Executive Director of the Shoah Foundation. Uh, he holds, excuse me, he holds the UNESCO Chair on Genocide Education and is also Adjunct Professor of Religion at the University of Southern California. Uh, a theologian by training, he has a particular interest in the impact of the Holocaust on religious and philosophical thought and practice. He wrote his dissertation on the trajectory of memory explaining how Holocaust survivor narrative, and in particular visual history, has developed over time and shaped the way in which the, uh, the implications of the Holocaust are understood. Uh, he founded the UK Holocaust Center uh, in Nottinghamshire, England, and co-founded the Aegis Trust uh, for the Prevention of Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide. And uh, he was also the inaugural chairman of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, which runs the National Holocaust Memorial Day in the UK. His publications include Never Again, Yet Again, a personal struggle with the Holocaust and genocide, and the Holocaust and the Christian world. So, so I'm, I'm tempted. Thank you. I'm tempted to jump in and answer all these questions, um, but I'm going to refrain um, because I would like to give just a little bit more context for this project, but perhaps to come at it from a slightly different perspective. So, so many questions. Um, is it appropriate to ask elderly people hundreds of disconnected questions about the most traumatic moment in their lives? What are the physical and psychological consequences of enduring five days of interviewing? Is it synthetic to ask questions in a random way or more natural? If we collect answers to thousands of questions, knowing that there are less than 200 questions typically asked of survivors, are we serving history by asking those questions at the expense of the survivor, him or herself? If we collect 200 of the most commonly answered questions, to reduce the workload on the survivor, but don't ask the questions that are most meaningful to them, do we do a misservice to their memory in pursuit of history? If we do ask over a thousand questions over five days and the system is not able to interpret their questions accurately or find appropriate answers to use quest to use as questions, what do we do? That is, what do we do about the fact that this person has spent their time to give us a, a very large um, portion of their lives? Shall we create digital versions of the interviewee? If we do, when would we use it? If we don't, what if we need it? Does 360 volumetric capture matter? Why not use a single camera and not worry about 3D and volumetric capture at all? What is the lowest f fidelity medium we could use? Um, flashcards, maybe? Audio? Would they be as effective in communicating the testimony itself? What if survivors don't like the medium? Do we still pursue the project? These questions, and probably another several hundred to go with it, were questions that we asked five years ago before we even spoke to the first Holocaust survivor about the possibility of creating the New Dimensions in Testimony program. Before I get on to how we began to answer them, I just want to go back for a moment in time, which I know some of your other presentations have done, but something that focused my mind on when working on this project. Uh, because we're a little short of time, I'm not going to play this whole thing, but I'm going to play just a few seconds of this. Heute ist der 24. April 1945. Meine Namen ist die Hella Goldstein. Ich erzähle mein Belieben, was ich belieben, überleben habe in den Lage Birgenwald. First 15 seconds of 93 seconds. I was doing some uh, research for another project, actually, um, and had to be l was looking through the British movie tone reel from Bergen-Belsen from April 1945, many seconds of which I had seen edited in a variety of different documentaries about the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. The images of the SS pulling the corpses and throwing them into the, the graves. The images of the bulldozers that we've all seen multiple times in documentaries. But I had never seen this face, Hella Goldstein. And as I sat there and looked at this, I realized I was probably watching the first audiovisual testimony of the Holocaust. 24th of April, 1945, in front of a mass grave at Bergen-Belsen. 
So uh, I was sitting at my computer, so I immediately went to the Visual History Archive and typed in Hella Goldstein and found out her name was Holland, Helen Collin when she gave testimony. So then I just uh, went through to her testimony and found that she'd given it in Houston, Texas, and so I called Mary Lee Wiebeck. I'd not stood up from my seat at this moment, and it was two minutes after hearing her testimony that I asked Mary Lee Wiebeck, is Helen Collins still alive? It looks like she lived in your community. To which she said, I need to see how she is. I believe she went into hospice yesterday. As it happened, she had to get pain medication. She was back home. I got on a flight and I went to see Helen Collin and ask her about that day when she gave the first audiovisual testimony about the Holocaust and asked her, what was that experience like? The stanza surprised me because I had assumed that she had agreed to give that testimony because she understood that that British movie tone camera was filming her in order to tell the world her story, which was true to one level. But there was another side to it, which was the, the audience she immediately identified in that conversation, which was the audience right in front of her. Her former captors, the SS that had been rounded up and were doing the job of filling that mass grave behind her seconds before, um, as well as on the other side of this, SS women. And what she, I said she told me was that moment was the greatest moment of fear because I realized when I told my story, I probably would die. Because the people in front of her were the people that were killing other inmates until just a few days previously. And she said, I assumed that there would be somebody in the watchtower that was just right by there that had been shooting at prisoners before that would shoot me at the moment I told the truth. But I couldn't help myself. I had to tell the truth in that moment. It was a moment of great fear. And I have that interview with her, which will become an addendum, I'm sure, to her VHA testimony at some point. <clears throat> so um, the trajectory of her story um, is, is multiple, as we've been talking about earlier. I've seen this picture many times already today, and even in the couple of sessions I've been in. Um, you know, David Boda uh, was in the field very early, and uh, he was dealing with new media right at that moment in time, um, and methodologically was finding his way, let's put it that way. Now, one of the people that he interviewed was the name, went by the name of Janine Binder, but you won't find her in the archive, the David Boda archive under that name. Because so egregious did she find his methodology, she refused to have it included in the archive, although we do have a transcript of it. What was interesting about it was that Boda didn't, couldn't differentiate a year after the Holocaust, because why would he, the difference between Belgets and Belson. So when she talked about her family being taken to the nearby camp of Belgets, he corrected her, interrupted her and corrected her. You mean Belson? To which she said, no, I mean Belgets. He said, okay, Belson. Um, and so uh, when she saw the, uh, the, the fact that her testimony is in the, in the collection, she asked to have it removed. It hasn't been deaccessioned actually, but it's not publicly available. Interestingly, Janine Binder, now Oberot, Oberotten, right? Oberotman, um, was one of the testimonies from the New Dimensions in Testimony Project, but not introduced by us, but by the Illinois Holocaust Museum, who was looking for testimonies from survivors in the Illinois region to place into their museum. Interesting that she's kind of self-selecting in this process, that she was there with Boda, and then there at the end of her... Um, towards the end of her life in the New Dimensions program. On the left is Anita Lasker Wolfish. Actually, it was her I was looking for in the British movie tone um, reel because um, I knew that she had spoken on the BBC uh, about her experience at Bergen Belsen and she appears in the reel several times. Um, and I just wanted it actually for some context on where she started her testimony. Interestingly, also in the New Dimensions and Testimony program. And remember, we only have 16 worldwide. So some of the survivors that spoke earliest are also the survivors that are speaking last. Or are the survivors that are using new media in 1945 are using new media in 2016. And we'll get to the issue of agency in a moment because the question is really who's in control here. 
Um, I hadn't met Pincus Gutter when he gave his testimony to the uh, Neuberger Holocaust Center in Toronto, which you will find in the Visual History Archive, because now we have this project preserving, of the legacy, preserving the legacy, which allows us to bring multiple archives into the same space. So Pincus Gutter's testimony and Pincus Gutter's testimony are both in the Visual History Archive, and indeed you can watch and see both. And if you go to the Shoah Foundation's Web, uh, front page of its test uh, uh, web page today, we have actually him telling the same story about leaving the uh, leaving Woods to go to the ghetto in both testimonies on the front page at the same time this morning to see how he tells those stories differently three years apart and in dif with a different interviewer. By the way, for the record, he tells me that the Toronto Holocaust uh, Center's um, interviewer was excellent and the USC Shoah Foundation's uh, interviewer hadn't got a clue what she was talking about. <laughs> I will tell you that I did watch his test Shoah Foundation testimony all the way through and there was an egregious breach of protocol during that um, testimony in which the interviewer literally tells him, you have to hurry up, I'm nearly out of tape to which you get the most fabulous response. And if you want to see um, a really amazing response to a bad interviewer, um, watch the last few minutes of Pincus Gooder's testimony. It's actually fa fabulous and fascinating. Uh, but of course, when he met um, me, I didn't know him in either of these contexts, and I d interviewed him actually for the Cape Town Holocaust Center, which is how I met him. A third testimony, which is about to be donated by the Cape Town Holocaust Center to the Visual History Archive. That will be three. It goes on from there. We've seen those two. Um, I made a documentary with him in 2002 called The Void, which was a, a documentary about his first visit back to Poland. Hebrew University made a documentary about him in 2014, which actually is his life history, because by that time, he was familiar with the, the, the topography and the landscape in Poland and could actually work with the film crew to tell his story through the sites and did so um, and created a, a more biographical um, documentary with them. New Dimensions and Testimony, this is Pinchas, not on a, uh, an 80 uh, inch screen, but actually life size on a Pepper's Ghost um, in front of an audience of 500 people where Heather and I are having a conversation with him um, in, a, in a live audience situation. Um, and <clears throat> more recently, uh, Pinchas is the subject of a photogrammetry um, room scale virtual reality piece called The Last Goodbye, where as you can see, we took him to Majdanek and filmed him there um, in a space that we, we, we did photogrammetry of so that you can actually be in that space with him as he describes the story. So the question that was asked a little bit a moment ago, so what is testimony? And this, this is a, a really good question in, in the case of Majdanek because in fact it is on the one hand, much more performative, because as you can see, there is a green screen behind him and lights and a, uh, a stereo pair of uh, cameras capturing his 3D image in that space, hardly natural. However, when in that space, notwithstanding the um, apparatus around him, and I was there for this um, filming, once that camera starts rolling, what comes out is testimony because the space itself and the memory of the space and what happened there, this is where he was separated from his father in that doorway. Doesn't matter how he tells it, the way in which he tells it, who's there with him, what apparatus is around him, he goes into storytelling mode, which is testimonial in, in, in its core. But in the emotionality that goes with that is he cannot separate himself from the space, no matter what the situation is. Um, we could have filmed him on a green screen in Toronto, of course, and said, imagine that you're now inside the dressing room at Majdanek. Uh, what we would have got is a very different uh, narrative and certainly a very different emotional uh, response. Okay, I've taken all my time just to do the introduction. One thing, though, um, just a little... Um, it's really scratch data because we're just, just going to start to look at this. Um, we turned everything that we've done with Pinchas into text. Um, this is on the, on the left-hand side, 1993. This is the term, the, talking about the term Sabina and synonyms of Sabina, because that could be my twin, my sister, so on. What you see is that the incidence of him speaking about uh, Sabina um, per thousand words in the narrative um, is uh, 0.87 per thousand words. He mentions his sister. By the time he gets to doing his new dimension and testimony, that's gone up to 0.16. These two actually are 
draft manuscripts of two books that are coming out. One is his biography with the Azraeli Foundation, and one is a book that he and I have authored together. It's about our journey of discovery of his testimony over the last 10 years. Um, what you notice is his willingness to talk about his sister goes up per thousand words over time, which is quite interesting. Um, whether she becomes a theme or a meme that he becomes comfortable with, or whether just he's now more able psychologically to talk about his sister remains to be seen. It's very, very, um, we haven't really had a chance to look at it. But then talk about trauma. Um, now, what's really interesting about this is not that he doesn't talk about trauma at all on his first interview. By the time he gets to NDT, he's talking about it a little. Um, in the book that he and I did together, actually we have a whole section where we talk about the issues of trauma. What's fascinating is the last of these works is one that he authored himself with a writer in which trauma, he, he seems to be now in 2016, just coming out, of, yeah, 2017, it's just been uh, copy edited, very comfortable talking himself about the issues of trauma in his life um, over that uh, 20 year period. Okay. Um, it's very preliminary, by the way, just to give you an idea of what I'm thinking about. Okay, so I've blown my time, um, and I had so much to say. Um, let me just, just cover just a very couple of very quick points. Um, first of all, um, about new dimensions in testimony. Um, I refer to this as inter interactive video biography. Um, I believe that the content of this is biographical. It is video and it's interactive, so it's kind of just a descriptor. Um, New Dimensions in Testimony is a way in which we kind of labeled it in order to be able to understand internally what to call this uh, research and development project. And it's important to say that this was, for, was a research and development project. To the question that was asked earlier, um, this project started as early as 2011. Nobody was filmed till 2014, and we didn't go into production till 2015. When we did film, um, it was with Pinker Scooter, and actually there's a reason for that. Um, it's because by that point in time, he and I had very high levels of interpersonal trust. And we knew that if an individual was going to have sufficient informed consent and be able to sit through the process of being in, a pilot, in pilot conditions where we literally didn't know whether it was going to be good for his welfare or not, so we could get feedback on that, whether or not um, the... the the studio that we created would work or not. And by the way, it failed on day one, of course. Uh, oh, we've lost that. Um, I'll just shut it down for now. Um, I just want to say a few things. What, what this project is, uh, New Dimensions and Testimony is a research and development project. Um, its methodological uh, frame of reference is the daily experience that Holocaust survivors already have right now, where they go into classrooms, they tell their story, and then they open to the floor for random questions to be asked of them. Um, the survivor answers questions basically sold on the curiosity of the individual members of the audience. Can't be predicted. Um, and yet, what we identified and what I'd seen over many years, um, and I think it came up in a conversation a moment ago, was that when students were sitting in a room with a Holocaust survivor and they heard that 45-minute episode, that sort of episodic um, short version of their testimony, they very rarely put their hand up and said, could you qualify, was that the 7th or 8th of May that you were deported from the Warsaw Ghetto? Their question was all about why. What does it mean? How do you feel? What is it? And basically those questions are really about what does this mean to me as I try and unravel this past and what you've just thrown at me? How do I make sense of that? I'm a believing person, but do you believe after what you've just been through? And very often the reference actually is not the survivor themselves, but the individual and their struggle to understand that past. In that situation, the issue of agency is already shifted to the audience, but willingly on the part of the Holocaust survivor. Why? Because they want them to start to address it in the context of their own lives. That's why they're sitting in that classroom in the first instance. What this project is not, um, you might have seen this already um, in various uh, um, descriptions as Holocaust as holograms. You might have seen the terms avatar, digital survivors, and so forth. None of these are actually accurate. In fact, it's not even about the visualization aspect of it. When we were creating this project, we struggled with the issue of um, whether or not we were even going to 
to capture these testimonies in a high fidelity environment because you could just simply place a, the camera, um, a, the regular HD or 4, 4K camera and film the individual in segments without all of the um, high fidelity paraphernalia that we currently use. The reason was actually to do justice to the testimony itself because our question was, um, if there is this move with technology that we're seeing already, we don't know, we cannot anticipate what forms of visualization will be available to us 5, 10, and 20 years from now. But we certainly can't ask these 88-year-olds that might form this project to come back in 10 years and redo their filming. So the question is then, what data do we want to capture that will give us the flexibility to be able to work with that as new platforms emerge? In the world in which we work, and by the way, this isn't a product, uh, a product, this is a testimony. It has various manifestations that we could implement which look and feel like an exhibit or a product in it, if, it's on a, if it's in an exhibit in an exhibition or a product on a phone. But actually that was, not the, that was not the end goal at the beginning of this project. The first thing was, can we capture this content and make a meaningful interaction which does the service to their memory and to their history in which they are actors in the creation of it itself. In the advisory team that put this together were three Holocaust survivors who sat through all of the, you know, the, the advisory meetings, were on set, were helping us to figure out what to do. You'll notice I use the word set. It is purposeful I use the word set because that exact is exactly what it is. We, in this case, we're not going into their home and having a, a chat by the fireside in an environment which, which they are comfortable. We're bringing them into a space which is, a, is for all intents and purposes, a uh, filming set. Um, what I'll end on this because there's too much to um, say otherwise. Um, what occurred when Pincus and I sat down for that first interview was that all the paraphernalia melted away. There's some discomfort to start with. I'm sitting 20 feet away from him looking through a 45 degree mirror. Um, so it's not exactly intimate. Um, and there are 116 cameras and 6,000 LED lights. But what he experiences inside that light stage is white light, pure white light, and my face, or the interviewer's face. That's all he sees. And so because he and I, or the interviewer and the interviewee, have eye contact, very quickly that studio disappears and you are in testimony mode. It's different to what they normally experience because normally you start and the trajectory of the, of the narrative just flows. Now they have to have an element of trust. And the trust is that Kia and her amazing team that have worked on this know enough about their life and their testimony to have put together a set of questions that will enable them to speak about their life one part at a time. Actually, what happens is they suddenly become really comfortable because the interviewer now knows everything about them unlike the interviewer that usually knows not very much about them or the Holocaust. And so the question goes, so tell me about the door in the attic. And you see that flicker of a moment, you know about the door in the attic? Well, yes, we know about the door in the attic because we've read everything and we've talked to you and we know where everything is. And so this immediate trust develops by which they then become very comfortable talking about things that are actually very detailed. I'll end by saying the average testimony in the Shoah Foundation is 2.5 hours. The average testimony in New Dimensions and Testimony is 15 hours. And Pincus has 20 hours of testimony. The issue is not do they have agency or not, but are we going to spend the time to really listen to them and ask questions that are intelligent and develop the literacy that we need to have to get at the content that he's given us? Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I think I speak for all of us when I say that these are really fascinating <coughs> presentations on uh, a really interesting topic and project. Um, so we have a little bit less than an hour now um, for um, a discussion about it. But before we sort of discuss all the papers, I just wanted to open it up and see if um, people have questions specifically directed at Stephen uh, you know, before we sort of focus on the, the topic as a whole. Um, yes, Thomas. Uh, okay, I guess there is an underlying assumption um, with this project that watching regular testimony is kind of boring and making 
um, a survivor um, converse with us uh, or talk with us uh, in real time is going to um, say, well, to, to solve this, uh, this problem. My question is, uh, because you mentioned technology and you wanted to have um, the most that is available uh, right now, but uh, my question is, and this is a question that I already asked um, at the um, Holocaust Center uh, in the UK, uh, I believe that was in July, is this technology retrofitable to older testimonies? I mean, can you cut up um, older testimony and make older testimony answer uh, the questions that uh, people might have to them now? So you asked several questions there, I think. Um, I'll start with the last one f first. Um, Actually, um, we took a, even before we started this process, we looked at the question of could we turn the VHA into a natural language um, interface that would allow you to ask questions such as this and get answers. The problem is that if I asked you the question, uh, do you forgive the perpetrators, for sure, of the 55,000 testimonies, you know, there are thousands of answers about that, about views on perpetrators. But you're gonna have to drop into the middle of a segment somewhere. You're not gonna be picking up at the beginning of a sentence. It may not actually answer that specific question directly. So is that answer there? Yes. Would, would you anticipate seeing natural language search in the VHA in future? Absolutely. Are we gonna, will these segments start to disappear as we get into transcripts and drop in at particular words? Absolutely. Um, that doesn't then preclude us then exploring, so how do you create this sort of more dialogue-based um, question and answer? Now, goes to, goes to another point though, to, to the same point. Um, if I ask you the question, um, do you believe in God after your experience, you're going to begin that answer with either an affirmative or a negative, yes or no, or maybe you're going to pause and say, well, that's complicated. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a direct question. If you ask the question, how has your religious faith changed? It's a completely different question, but it's getting at the same content piece. But if you just simply say, no, uh, my faith hasn't changed, then actually you're not really giving the, giving the user, the, answering their question, which is, and in what ways has it changed? So in this particular case, what we, have, what we do, we structure uh, around any given subject matter, multiple questions that address the same subject matter. What it means is then, um, you actually, from the same individual, get a variety of perspectives on the issue, let's just pursue that one, of faith and belief, and how the experience has altered, changed, or not. And sometimes they're contradictory, which is even better. Um, so that you might say, um, you know, all, all, he might answer, so if you say, how has your religious faith changed? He might say, I still, I, I believe in God. No matter what happened to my family, I believe in God. Then you ask, her, how has your practice changed? He might say, well, I feel a little guilty because I do believe in God, but I don't fulfill, I don't fulfill the 613 mitzvot anymore, even though my grandfather did. And that puts me in a really difficult, whatever it might be. So actually by continuing to explore the theme and sometimes in group settings, you do get, you don't get these random questions, which is, um, tell me about your, your grandmother, tell me about God and belief, do you have nightmares? Very often questions come clustered, particularly in a social learning sex, uh, setting where one um, user, uh, one, one member of an audience will ask a question and then it will spark something in the minds of the others. So that will follow it. So part of what we were doing was sequencing. What is the obvious, if you ask that question and get that answer, what's the obvious next question? And by the way, we do that in real time in the studio. So that if he asks a question and there is an answer, uh, Kia and Heather are sitting there taking notes and then th what happens is we do a follow-up question because one thing will lead to another. You can't do that just by doing a natural language search within a testimony. Final thing, boring, not boring. This isn't about boring or not boring. Actually, I think testimony, we, we see the statistics that demonstrate that young people are not bored watching testimony. Their average use time in eyewitness is 45 minutes per session. That, now, kids with uh, intention spans that are very low, if they were bored, they would move on to the next thing. And by the way, this is, this is in a non 
uh, it includes in non-classroom settings, in other words, when they're at home. So we don't think that kids are getting, we don't think that users are bored with, with standard testimony. In fact, quite the contrary. It's just another way of developing uh, content that's accessed in a different way. Uh, this is re really fascinating. Uh, we, I saw uh, uh, him uh, in 3D last year, I think in 2016. And uh, uh, I mean, this conversation about testimonies, and, and uh, yeah, I was a little bit perplexed when I first saw this. But I, 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 I really like it now, uh, framed the way you have framed it. So. Is this a testimony? Yes. Are you interviewing Pincus? No. So if you frame it like, because it's, it's not, you have a set of questions and only certain questions. So there is, there is some interactivity with Pincus, but within a context that is set, framed, and all the permutation are calculated by you. So, uh, just, this we if you and if, if you come to it, if, uh, to this from the point of view that you are not interviewing Pincus, you are listening to Pincus talking about certain things, because you cannot ask him, "Do you like soccer?" It probably is not in the range of, of questions. I think there is a great value in framing it like this. Just, just an observation, I think. Um, you probably can ask him that actually. <laughs> Um, to the earlier point that, that we asked, that was brought up, um, we anticipated that there would be this um, kind of foolery with the technology, trying to test where the boundaries are of it. Um, I can tell you that it does exist with two user groups. Holocaust historians. <laughs> and techies. But not with 15-year-old boys. It does not exist. In all the testing we've done, we have never seen misuse from teenagers. There's a level of respect that comes with engage. I'm, I'm correct, right? Yeah. Correct. yeah. Um, the I think there is a level of respect which comes maybe where it's curated. So you're already in a museum setting. You're already in a structured environment. You're in a classroom, whatever it is. And there are sort of understood rules of engagement. I think. Um, I think maybe the question would be, once it's mobile and is on the button of your iPhone, will that happen? And you know, that's, that's another whole other question for us to address. Um, we did prepare for that somewhat, and we also talked extensively um, with the survivors about it themselves. So what happens if you're asked these questions that are inappropriate? How do you feel about that? Um, and, yeah, they say that we put ourselves in front of the public every day and run that risk every day. So it's no different to that. And as long as we're thinking about it in advance, then that's fine. It doesn't make any difference. The same would apply to the Visual History Archive or putting it on YouTube, that comments would come in that would be abusive and so forth. They see it in that same realm. It, to them, it's uh, honestly, I think to the, to the Holocaust survivors, it's just another platform by which they're going to tell their story. And it, you know, they start by talking about the fact that in their homes there was a brass bell telephone and now they're sitting there with smartphones. They just know that technology is moving and they just want to make sure that in some way or other they're contributing to whatever the new format is as they did with video in the 1990s, in a way. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I find this way of accessing testimony very exciting, especially as a high school educator. Uh, but one thing that does strike me about this technology and that hasn't been discussed in depth is the third mediating but unseen role between Pincus and the user. In a traditional video testimony, there's an interviewer whose questions are often explicitly heard or seen. With this technology, the intermediating role is the computer algorithm, which selects which segment to play back based on user response. Assuming this technology improves and we approach the horizon that Dan mentioned, this mediating force is necessarily going to become more and more and more powerful, but still hidden in many ways from the user. 
What concerns, if any, do you have about this intermediating role, and what have the researchers on this project done to consider or discuss this role? I think it's, it's something for all of us, actually. Um, so let, maybe I'll just answer how we dealt with it within the project, and it would be great to hear from the others on this. Um, so the first thing to say is um, this is not an AI and it's not an Android. I mean, that there's elements of it, as we just heard from Dan, that um, might fit that you know, way of thinking. Um, but it, while machine learning is deployed within this system, um, to enable us to be able to better answer and anticipate the questions that people might ask based on real conversations that have been taken place or real data that we've collected. So it's important to state, every interaction with, the, uh, with Pinchas and the other Holocaust survivors in this uh, group, um, the, the interaction is recorded. That is to say, the words are taken down and we need to make, we, what we're looking at is, do, was the user who asked the question, did they get the answer? And to Dan's point, no. Because whatever problem with the uh, uh, ASR, the, the speech recognizer that, that's deployed. Um, so we'll look at that and see, was it the speech recognition software? Or was it the natural language processor? What, what was it that was not getting Dan the result? And obviously if it breaks at the level of speech recognition software, then you're, you're not gonna get correct answer or you're not going to get any answer. So the first thing is that, and I think uh, the lady who's just left from, who's the librarian at UCLA, asked the question about that. And that, that's a really important one in terms of your question about the ethics of the algorithm, to use Todd's uh, very apt term, um, is that um, providing, ensuring that as many people as possible can interact with it is very tricky because accents do make a difference. Um, although, um, you know, every, all of this is done on APIs. So, you know, as Google or Microsoft or whoever we're using at any given point in time, ABM Watson, improve their own speech recognition softwares, then we just switch it over to whatever the API that's got the best at the time. And by the way, we test them all um, frequently. Um, the other thing that we had a problem with was technical terms linked to the Holocaust itself. For example, problem for Pinchas, he was in Majdanek. Google ASR didn't recognize Majdanek. We literally had to ask a bunch of students just to keep using the word Majdanek into the ASR on a regular basis until Google, the machine learning that's taking place at Google eventually began to recognize the word because they wouldn't intervene with the ASR and the machine learning at their end to put the word Majdanek into the Google ASR. So it, this, for the first year, simply wouldn't answer a question about his concentration camp life because you couldn't ask him about Majdanek and it'd be intelligible. So this, this is kind of taking place you know, in parallel with the technology itself. Finally, um, still continuing on, this, on, on the issue of the ethics of, around this. Um, you know, um, the, mach the machine learning that is taking place has a lot of uh, human intervention. That is to say, you know, we, 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 have a, we have a full research project going on at the moment with IBM Watson and it's going fine and we're working in Mandarin and IBM Watson and it's fabulous and so on and so forth. But it all has limitations. And actually the human intervention, that is somebody looking and somebody being Kia and Gillian and, and the team, somebody looking at each of those interactions and saying, from a human perspective, are we getting the result that the individual is looking for actually provides us at the moment with that um, uh, cushion between the technology and what it means to communicate as a human being um, with the content. The idea is that the more it's used, the more efficient it will be. And in fact, we have already seen great improvements from moving from Pinchas to the next set to the next set, where all the learning that's taking place on the previous sets then gets applied. But they all have specific lives and specific stories. So then you pay attention to all of that. And that actually only comes with um, time and human intervention. You don't want to respond to Paul? I have a, a yeah, I'll follow you. So what strikes me here is, you know, again, I have great, great respect for what you guys are doing, so I don't want this to seem some other, uh, but it also has variant meanings from the intentionality of the author. And so the Shoah Foundation has a certain authorship in relation to this, but there's, 
invariably variant meanings of what that means in relation to the world. I cannot not look at this as an extension of the virtual humans, which I've been looking at for 10 years, um, though I understand what you're saying. I have to, have to say, though, though, what I got from the people that were designing the virtual humans, which I've become sort of a structuring notion for myself, which is the idea that it doesn't have to be intelligent. It only has to appear that way because we as humans read meaning into every communicative gesture of the face, of the body, of everything else. So you cannot not communicate. It is a fundamental thing of communication, right? So the idea that these, so every little moment of digression from the script becomes a meaning that the algorithm provides for the subject who's actually looking at it. And I think that's a really important thing, back to the notion of the algorithm. The, you know, I wrote here, the algorithm becomes a structuring agent of the machine consciousness. And again, you know, he's a machine. I mean, there's a real Pincus in the world, but there's also this um, representational body. So I just, and the notion of the third space, which is kind of in between, you know, it's, a, it's again a thing from psychoanalysis, which is the notion that there's these sort of two unconsciousnesses that are communicating across this sort of, you know, spatial relation and it just strikes me that one of them doesn't have to be actually communicating because we read into it so much meaning that we believe the communication is happening and again these other engineers that created earlier iterations of this kind of stuff said it doesn't it doesn't you know the problem with ai is it's trying to replicate human intelligence well it doesn't have to it only has to replicate the intentional structures of human intelligence which is the semiotics of the face of the human and i think that what's fascinating about pincus is he does that greatly and that's what kind of structures my interest. I think to get back to this issue of ethics, for me, um, the contract between the user in this case um, and the testimonial object or, or subject, whichever term we want to use to describe Pincus, um, and a lot of that has to do with duration and context. So if you're asking a question of Pincus and that question is genuinely, um, let's say if you ask him a question relating to what was the most traumatic experience you had in your life, and let's say it, it, it evokes an answer that is, does in fact speak to trauma, but maybe not to the, the most traumatic experience in his life. It is true to um, the, that moment in that testimony, but not to the larger duration of his testimony. And so this is not a, a form of testimonial engagement, which for me is about duration, about the duration in which you have um, an active listening. Um, it is more, as I said, about the user-driven editing. And for me, that context can be troubling um, insofar as that um, it does, again, focus on the most dramatic. What are the most extreme? What are the most uh, kind of eventful moments of, of, of your life? Um, and I think, you know, when I was talking with Stephen about that uh, some years ago, that there's an emphasis in which student satisfaction with Pincus tended to be less on whether or not the answers were on topic and more as, as to whether or not they had been impactful. And so what is impactful versus what is on topic? What is uh, dramatic versus what is more authentic? And that those things aren't always in correlation with one another. And that, and that to me is still a part of a, that if you look at a 30 minute clip of video testimony and you have the duration and you see the unfolding in associative ways, sometimes linear, sometimes it's not of testimony, you get a larger slice of the ethics which are inscribed in context through duration in that video testimony than you do with Pincus. It doesn't mean it's not possible to harvest that from Pincus. It, but I do think the conditions of possibility to reuse that word aren't conducive as it currently exists to that kind of duration through which we can have the ethical contract maintained. Um, so as we shift to sort of a, a broader discussion among all the panelists, I think um, I'll briefly use my prerogative as chair to sort of ask a question myself. Um, you know, uh, and this question has two parts and I, 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 I want to be able to have everybody else ask the question so I'll keep it very brief. Um, you know, one of the things that really strikes me um, about this project and at the Shoah Foundation and the way that we're talking about it in general here is the use of the term and the terminology of archive and archives. Um, and um, it seems to me that there are a number of ways in which this kind of language and idea is important. Uh, in as much as um, we can talk about archives 
as um, having certain kinds of meaning and purpose to them as to why people create them, why people call things archives as well. And um, you can, I can think of um, at least two of these types of meanings that are relevant in this context, you know, one of which is an epistemological framework in as much as archives are, are, are seen uh, sort of in a, um, in, in a public sense, as, and, and also I would say um, to a large extent in a, uh, in a professional one as well as being um, institutions that at least try uh, and projects that try to preserve a type of truth and authenticity. Um, and secondly, and, and this is also relevant to this particular project, is that archives um, are notorious for their, uh, for their efforts to control access. Um, and to curate um, not only materials, but also who can access them and what kind of questions can be asked of them. Um, and so the question that I want to ask about this is what is the meaning of this attempt at authenticity? And what is its utility? Is it really necessary to have um, an actual Holocaust survivor who it, people are interacting with? Um, in as much as like, uh, you know, Stephen was, was talking about sort of the, our inability to, to um, easily project forward what technological developments will be possible in 15, 25, 100 years, you know, one could imagine the possibility based off, what, like for instance, what, what Thomas was saying, that you could, um, based off of the entirety of the Shoah Foundation's visual history archive, uh, construct a master, a master uh, version of somebody who can answer a number, like a, a wide variety of questions about people from a certain region, as opposed to one particular person's experience, uh, and also based off of our combined and growing knowledge of the events of the Holocaust itself. So, you know, if you'll allow me to sort of imagine, you know, one could think that you are on a tour of a concentration camp, and they give you some sort of augmented reality goggles, where you have a a Holocaust survivor, so to speak, who walks alongside you and talks to you about the things that you're seeing, um, not based on any one individual's experience, but based off of a combined set of information that is then been recorded by somebody who is not necessarily an authentic Holocaust survivor, but who represents a wider experience uh, in that particular space or otherwise. And I was wondering if you could maybe comment on this question of, of what it means to have authentic experience for the individuals who are encountering this, you know, especially, you know, as we enter, you know, uh, eventually the age, you know, um, when the Holocaust survivors are going to pass away, you know, I'm very curious to sort of hear the ethical implications and the, uh, and sort of the impulses behind a little bit more um, why it, like this project, you know, serves this, this need. Oh, sorry. Right there. So, so I was writing this down when you were mentioning this. So, so the ICT, the Institute for Creative Technologies, is doing exactly this already. And it strikes me that it talk, the notion of authenticity. So, this is something that really struck me again. There was this, um, I believe it was Colonel I met that was talking about what the point. Because I said the same thing. You have these sort of video game aesthetics of these training simulations for officers in the combat field. And I said, but you know, it seems like you're still not getting the wind, the rain, the heat, other, you know, the specificity of individuals interacting with you. And he brought up a statistic which he said, if you're gonna die in combat, you'll probably die in the first six weeks. And the idea of the training sim simulations they were doing were to keep the new, the new officers alive because if they could get past the first six weeks, then they would probably survive for a much longer period of time potentially for you know, the whole tour of duty, right? Which strikes me is, if that isn't authenticity, I don't know what is, right? I mean, so, and, and again, it was, but it was using these sort of video game aesthetics because that was what the training officer candidates were familiar with as a sort of like sensibility in relation to the games they'd played as teenagers or whatever as they're coming into the setting. So uh, it strikes me that there's a variable meaning in relation to what authenticity is. And I know there's a set, certain set of criteria that follows with the testimony and stuff like that, but it strikes me that there's broader notion of authenticity that can be applied to these settings. And, I, and I, one thing I left out of my thing was, back to the notion of the cartooning is, you know, one of my, my impulses is, you know, obviously Mouse, but also Waltz with Bashir, right? Two things that use, that get at an event that can't actually have photographic documentary evidence, and yet it does a really great job of dealing with this, the event as a sort of like psychological totality, right? So, anyway, that's just my comment. I, I mean, I remember giving talks 15 years ago to organizations like Holocaust survivor organizations who are training their children and grandchildren to tell their stories for them. You have in Hiroshima, 
and Nagasaki efforts to train docents to, to be surrogates of memory. Um, and yet the NDT project, I think, has taken off much more so, let's say, in r relation to the second and third generation testimony efforts, precisely because there is this need, I still think, for the embodied authenticity of the survivor and that there is a relationship between his or her kind of bodily, pre you know, embodied presence and the historical experiences that they directly encountered. And I still think we're not, we're not at that period where we can have this kind of composite, I think inevitably we will get to that point, but I still think there's enough anxiety to use a term that's circulated quite a bit today about, about the physical departure, which I still think we need that embodied real, right? In, embodied in the person of the survivor, whether it's in this form or in some other form that can't yet be a composite. It has to be a, a more direct connection to the individual. And, and specifically to that point, actually in the creation of the New Dimensions project, um, our contract with the survivors is that um, their testimony, uh, that their answers to the questions will remain whole segments, um, that they will not be digitized, they will not be edited. Uh, there's one proviso there. Sometimes answers contain, an answer will contain two distinct stories or two con distinct answers. So we do have the ability to split. So if, some, if there's a self-contained answer within the answer that's given, then that can sit alone as a sub-answer if you, if you like, if it, if it answers a specific question. Actually, we've not done it yet, right? Um, but we, we have that ability to do that. Um, we have um, the ability to create a digital clone of the Holocaust survivor. We've scanned them. We have all of their facial scans and all the rest of it. Um, that is purely for the purpose of managing the transitions to Dan's point at the moment. We've left it just as a dissolve because that tells you I'm working with a video. But we anticipate that in due course, and a lot of what we data we collect was about anticipation. Not what we want to do now, but where, what will the expectation be later about morphing between the, the, um, between, from one answer to the other, using depth sensors, using infrared depth sensors, and having 360 um, content um, that we, enables us to see this uh, volumetrically. But the, not the digitization of the character itself, and that's, that's in the contract with them. Um, what you can anticipate happening, I would say, um, at USC Show Foundation is us moving from a phase which you're just seeing right now where we've, we've done a, a program that establishes the, um, the methodology for doing interactive testimony to then going into a collection phase, which will just be about building archival content without necessarily having an output from it. In other words, having those interviews with Holocaust survivors that enable us to capture that content. What you can anticipate seeing is an archive of volumetric testimony taken in the field, in, uh, in places where they experience those, those experiences. What you can anticipate is volumetric capture for use in AR for short stories, linking artifacts that will be captured volumetrically to stories about artifacts also collected uh, um, volumetrically. So what's going to occur, I think, uh, here's the irony of this. At the point at which everyone thought the survivor testimony collection had finished, we're about to go into a very intensive collection phase, um, which will create a whole new a kind of um, volumetric embodiment of the, of the interviewee, but telling that story in a variety of different ways, which they already do do. Because actually, the linear life history only happens once in their life, or twice if you're Pincus or Rennie sort of, uh, Firestone. Most only do that linear life history once. But they speak in a variety of contexts, and they tell short stories in a variety of contexts. And they sit in museums with their artifacts and their yellow stars and their teddies and all the rest of it. And they talk about their experiences. Not that, that hasn't been captured. So uh, you can anticipate that that will be captured. Um, in such a way that it forms an archive in its own right. And then all the digital humanities people in this room and many more besides can then decide how we're going to visualize that and represent it in future. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, can you talk about the... Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Can you talk more about the preservation planning for this sort of media? Um, and especially as you're about to collect more, how you're planning to preserve all of that? If, is it going to be accessible online? Um, and then I was also wondering if there are any outtakes and answers that you decided not to include, and are those being preserved somewhere and will eventually be accessible? So as far as the outtakes question, every single answer we can use, we do use. So every once in a while, there's a technical issue. There's something wrong with the sound. You can hear something in the background. Um, those we don't include in, in the system you can see right there. We do preserve it um, with, alongside the rest of the clips just as a raw clip on the green screen, because he was filmed on green screen, as you saw in uh, Stephen's presentation. Um, we preserve all of these testimonies right alongside the rest of our archive. So over in our other building, the ITS building, and it's all preserved in perpetuity the same way uh, the rest of the archive is. We're only using a fraction of the data we've captured so far. Um, each survivor was filmed with somewhere between 50 to 116 cameras. The only thing the public's seeing right now is one camera view. We're preserving all of that and uh, we'll continue to do so. I think that was. Uh, thanks, and I, I'm looking around at the people in the visual panel tomorrow, and, and I'm thinking about someone who's really been very much in control of this environment, someone who's a cartoonist, someone who's a film studies person, and someone who's done documentaries as well as many things, and yet, no one has talked about form. You haven't talked about composition, you haven't talked about color, you haven't talked about the fact that it's a full body as opposed to a torso, very much different than other kinds of visual strategies. And so I'd like to hear something about form here. How is the form related to the content and what does that mean in terms of this as it relates to other kinds of testimonies, which for example, are not full body. You know, so, so even that, they're not elevated. They're not, they're not you know, so, there's, so there's a lot of formal elements here. And since this is actually a panel of people that are very sophisticated with form, I'd like to hear about it. Lighting, composition, color, all of those things. How does it relate to the content? Okay. So um, data is collected as raw as possible. Um, so the, you know, the lighting conditions are, um, it's, a, it's a white light. Um, that's um, not directional. It can be directional if you want it to be. So here's the thing. We can change how that form looks under lighting conditions. We can color match the temperature, color temperature of this room to that image. Um, so we can make that um, image look like the same skin tones as we have in this room here. That's why we've gone for that um, particular uh, format. He's full body because we wanted to ensure that we can see all of him. But of course, he's also filmed in, uh, he's in 4K, but let, latterly 6K. We can push into head and shoulders if that's what we want to put onto our devices, if they're going to be smaller devices or in the given thing. We felt that we wanted to um, see full body um, because we wanted to see the whole person. Um, there are some constraints, as you can see, in terms of how, uh, in a seated position. Um, and it does become a little constraining because, um, and it, it's one of, probably the, one of the few things that does affect the demeanor of the interviewee during the interview. Because although they're completely free to move during the answer to the question, because they fear, because they're returning to what we call a first position. So effectively what happens is they start, they choose a position they're comfortable in. And what we need to be able to do is in order to get back to transition so that we're not actually doing as much digital manipulation. We want to do the minimum amount of digital manipulation. So what it means is them coming back to a position where they feel comfortable, which for Pinkus this was it. Um, what tends to happen is they get a little stuck in that position because they kind of don't feel so free. Now, there are times as you'll see, Pinkus is waving his arms and doing whatever. Uh, but that, that is a constraining issue. It's filmed on a green screen. Um, it obviously means that we can 
put whatever background we want to. So the question is, what background? What you'll notice is, we've, so far, we've only really used it in a black background, apart from very early pilot, where we showed it in a, in a different context. Um, because actually, we've discovered that people actually like the embodiment of the person, the, the individual, without the the context of things that we've superimposed because we thought that a library would look great. Um, so, um, but that means, so the, the, the push for raw data was really important for us because we were trying not to create something that was platform specific or product specific, but gave us a particular um, uh, set of data that we had to choose a particular pose. Um, that is, we, it was either, st well, first of all, we found out when we did try to interview that uh, 85 year old standing, it lasted about 10 minutes. So seating was the most comfortable place for them. Um, and we did try it, by the way. It was one of the, one of the options, because that gives much more freedom. We'd rather hoped that they would be able to talk, like they would stand in front of a group and just be natural talking standing. Didn't work practically. So some of it was practical constraints, as well as aesthetic decisions. So I have to say that it, my answer is the comic book I gave you, because actually that's just a little tiny portion. I have like. 10 notebooks full of Pincus drawings. I've been drawing Pincus for the last, actually it started about the time I got done talking to you. Um, and because I'm fascinated by his, his visuality. And so in the thing, I've actually put close-ups, I've grabbed frame grabs of him, I've done him in, with white screen, with objects, because somebody had mentioned how he's supposed to be in a sort of environment. I've done that, and I've actually, if you look at one of them, he's tilted forward, he never does that. I've never seen it. Maybe there's some moment he does that, but he does not do that gesture. And I thought to myself, what would he look like if he did do that? And so I, I've sort of, so again, this doesn't really focus on that, but I've sort of actually been like, I understand the visuality of him incredibly well because I've been drawing him so much. And, to, and the, even the position of his feet and the position of his hands, his fingers move sometimes, his, he spreads his fingers out some, and, and his legs kind of short, back and forth. Now it may seem you know, like, well, superficial or something, but that's his, that is what makes him human, right? And so I've tried to treat him in the visual, what, the way of visualizing him and what I'm sort of working on, I'm trying to imagine him as a human because that was the number, I, at one point I said something, a, a virtual simulation, I was like, whoa, he, he's real. And, I, and at the time I kind of poo-pooed that, but I thought, you know, there's, there's we, we, again, the projection to, of us onto the subject, and so I've been trying to do that. So I know it's not at all what, uh, you know, I love the maps and the, the various uh, G, GIS data and stuff, and I'm totally sympathetic for that, but I'm trying to go the other direction, which is what does the user experience with, so I, you know, there's a little Fleischer car cartoon in there, version of him on the back to make you happy, because he makes me happy, right? So that, that's, you know, that's my grandfather actually, but it's Pincus, right? So I, so I think there's effective levels that the visuality brings forward that could be mapped as well. Now, it's not so systematic in this thing, but it, it's there as a possibility. So I, I'm, I'm just saying that as an addendum to what you were saying, but. Um, and I, I think, uh, one of the reasons we show the whole body, uh, even though, as Stephen said, they don't tend to move as much in every single clip, there's such small movements when they're talking. You see them start tapping their feet when they're thinking about certain things or when they're relaying certain things. They itch at their leg or, you know, they're tapping on the chair. Those little small things that really is what makes makes them human because they are human. You, you see, and if we were to just catch from the chest up, we'd be missing that. Even though it seems small, it really adds to it. Well, I, I still think there's something about this, the scalability of him that actually engenders not a full body encounter, but actually still the eye, the eye contact. For me, it's still about the eye contact and whether you had shown him in medium close up or in his full body. I, I, used to idealize the notion that if you show, and I still believe that if you show a whole person and body performing testimony that you'll see precisely those, those gestures of memory that you wouldn't see with a medium close up. But I think because of the particular kind of constraints that one has to have, also because you need to have some sort of continuity with Pincus, it's so it restrains the full, the full gestural expression that you could have not within the particular chunk, but certainly across. So that ultimately he goes, I mean, here he is in his waiting stance. Here is Pincus the screensaver right there. And it's interesting because he's waiting silently for you to, he's nodding his head, 
waiting for you to ask, ask him his question. And there's one point when I asked him a question at the Holocaust Museum in 2016, I said, um, what, is, what is your biggest regret? And uh, he appears in this waiting stance. And um, I watch the other people in the room trying to react to his silence and they don't know what to do and there's this awkward moment where they want to interrupt him to say, well, well, what are you going to say? And then right before someone's about to ask him a question, he says that I cannot remember my sister, that I cannot be with her, my twin sister. So this idea of, of the waiting stance that you have him here is almost suggesting silence, right? That he is always kind of about to speak or waiting for you to trigger him into speech. There's something there um, that I think has a reception effect on people who are using him where they're not quite sure what to do um, with this waiting stance and that there's something uh, kind of liminal for that in that he moment. Agrees with you. And he agrees right. with me. No, he's, not a good he's not, yeah, so. so. I think I just want to give, say one other thing about this. Um, the concept developer, Heather's not here this evening, um, but she was very, very clear about certain things. Had to be human scale. Um, had to answer questions um, without a docent or without an intervention. You've got to be able to walk up and speak as an answer wherever you start from. Has to be eye contact. Difficult, by the way, because then we had to then ask the Institute of Creative Technologies to create a contraption that would allow the interviewer to be able to speak because they have to look straight into the lens. So the only way you can do that is by them looking into this 45 degree mirror and then creating this connection through the mirror. Um, those, those sort of visual concepts that she insisted on, which forced the technicians to start to think about how to actually do that to get to a point where you move it from um, the, 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 the flat um, and non-eye contact image. There, there's, a, there's another form of volumetric capture done by a company called 8i, and its big failing is because the cameras are all around you, there is no, there is no eye contact with the subject ever. Even if you chase them around, you can't actually get eye contact with them um, because there's no, there's no point of, in other words, there's not another human being on the other side of the lens. So you, you have to have that connection with the human being that's asking you the questions to get eye contact because then it's a real eye contact that actually took place between me and him in reality because I was the one that interviewed him. But it's actually genuine to the content that he's giving you at that moment because he was relaying it at that moment eye to eye. And the other volumetric... Uh, um, stage that we could have used but don't use doesn't allow you to do that because you can never really get that full human interaction. So kudos to her. She kept us kind of true to those um, elements, knowing that they were always going to be, you know, he's, he's still a digital you know, video character in a sense. Well, he is. Um, but trying to sort of drive to what's, what's the instinct as a human being when you talk to another and how close can we get to that? knowing the limitations. And I'm really sorry to have to tell you, I was due to speak at an event on campus at 7.30 this evening and the event got moved to Beverly Hills. So I'm actually going to have to just duck out at this moment and run for it. Um, but just to say, it's been a ple pleasure and I'll let you guys finish the conversation. And thank you so much for your work on, on researching this and your questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, even though Stephen has to duck out, um, we do have time for one or two more questions. So maybe um, if I can collect um, the last couple questions and then the rest of the panelists can sort of say a brief concluding uh, word. Um, so um, um, yes, do you wanna, yeah, yeah. I was also about to ask Stephen, but I guess um, that's a a couple of questions related to, to Noah as well. So I'm, I'm, I want to go back to, to, to the, um, the question of whether this is, can count as a testimony or not. And uh, I don't think this is a problem of nomenclature, of, you know, of how you name something. But when, I mean, one of the basic, I think, the foundational principles of a testimony in literature it is, uh, at least, is that it is audiovisual testimony, that is, is that it is non-edited. And yet, Noah has used repeatedly the notion of a user-driven editing, right? That's the meaning of the still camera, that's the meaning of the non-edited process, video recording. So, 
what's going on here? I mean, this is, this is foundational in the sense that it, it has multiple layers relating to ethics, uh, methodologies, narratives behind the very notion of the still camera and the non-edited interview. And this takes me to the second, I think, foundational principle of the audiovisual testimony, which is context, in the sense that the testimony itself is produced through interaction. And we experience this interaction. I mean, it's not hidden behind an algorithm. It's there. We might not be seeing the interviewer, but we are listening to him. So we are kind of participating in a discussion here. So discussion is foundational, is, is essential to, to the notion of testimony. Now, if this is the case, then what is this? Uh, in the sense, I mean, I'm not disparaging it. I'm just asking whether we see a rapture here, a kind of a paradigm shift. This is something different. Or whereas this is kind of an augmented testimony, testimony 2.0. And uh, I'm rounding this up by actually hijacking Adam's question and, um, and, and, and asking if the, the moment of the audiovisual testimony right, uh, was related to a historiographical shift as well, right? We wanted to record the voices of the survivors in order to get to know something. Now, if you already knew everything from the start, why, why conduct the testimony? I mean, what are the new kind of questions that the new kind of historiographical problems, issues, that this kind of technology allows us to, to perhaps answer or pursue? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is there um, maybe one more question to sort of wrap up, and then we can turn it over to the uh, over to the panel? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, even before we had access to this technology, um, the um, we were already experiencing a filtered or an edited version of who or what survivors were. Um, one was because they were dying out. Uh, so we're left, even before this type of technology, with uh, being able to interview only people who were children as they survived. We no longer have adult um, memories that are being captured. Um, and also, um, of the people who made appearances at universities and museums, uh, to be able to give testimony to people who were not familiar with survivors of any type of conflicts. Um, people were chosen who would not be a wild card. I mean, we all know that um, human beings of any group or nationality have quite a variety of personalities. And the people who had personalities that would answer in um, any sort of unusual fashion could certainly not be the ones that were being uh, uh, put forth at museums or schools. So um, I think Pincus is like the most distilled version that we're getting now because we have, we have to have somebody, it will mainly be um, young people who are seeing um, Pincus or the other, the several others who, um, will be doing the same thing. And most of them not only will have never met in their life a survivor, they will have never met a Jew. Or um, some of you who work with um, other conflict people, Cambodia, you mentioned in the back, or there's others of you who are taking testimony from Rwandans. Most of the students who see these testimonies will have never in their life met a real Cambodian or never in their life met a real Rwandan, whether it's a survivor or anybody else. So we have to have a Pincus. I, I imagine Pincus is selected because people would find him identifiable because um, they wouldn't mind thinking, oh, Pincus wouldn't be a bad grandfather to have. Um, and so we, we're left with, you know, we're gonna be left with something that's an icon. We're not going to be left with 
anything that represents a wide range of survivors or a wide range of experiences or even a wide range of looks because the look of the survivor has to be one that everybody would find likable. Yeah, to, uh, let me address that point and then the other point. Um, one is, yes, I mean, he is by nature of one of 16 exemplary. He is exceptional. He is not, you know, uh, he is not a representational, of, a representative, I should say, of the larger body of survivors. He was chosen for a particular reason, because he had a rapport, let's say, with Stephen Smith, but also because he performs testimony in a particular way, right? And there's certain kind of, you know, that that's, um, that he is like that he will become iconic because he also embodies a certain kinds of, of testimonial performance. But to get back to this issue, your concern about editing and your concern about context, um, the placement of the camera is in itself an act of editing. Are you covering the entire body? Is it a medium close-up? What questions you ask? Do you start at the beginning, middle, and end? That is an editorial choice. It is in-camera editing, if you will. So I mean, I. I guess I'm haunted by the legacy of doing my qualifying exams in film and media studies in this very library and Bazan's notion of, you know, even when you place a camera, you know, the bicycle thief, oh wait, that's not reality unfolding in front of the camera. Even that is in itself an editorial process of how you place the camera, the questions that you ask, having a sequence, having a beginning, middle, and end, that all constitutes an act of narrative and plotment, which is in a sense also editing. Um, context. It's not dissimilar if you watch a film called The Last Days or if you even look at films with talking heads about the Holocaust, of which there are thousands, to, and including in-house documentaries or documentaries that were produced in association with the Fortunoff Archive, Witness Voices from the Holocaust, or that other documentaries produced through the Holocaust Museum, where the presence of the interviewer is not acknowledged, where the interviewer's voice has been edited out. In, in, in museum exhibitions, you often, more, more times than not, you will hear the interviewee and not the interviewer. So there's nothing at all. This is, so I actually think this is perfectly in keeping with genealogies of testimony, both filmic and video and written. Also in written uh, testimonies, not often having just the I voice and not the what did you think. The editing out of, of the interviewer is, is completely um, common. And so this idea that somehow this constitutes a, a, a rupture from testimonial tradition, I think it's very much in continuity with that. It doesn't mean, however, that I don't have concerns about the context or the decontextualization of Pincus's testimony out of that narrative sequence, and that I think it does require a kind of testimonial literacy, as I would have coined it, um, to, to know him, to know him and his story. The more you know of him, the more you'll be able to probe the depths of his testimony. Um, but I think these concerns about context and these concerns about editing are concerns that we could also apply and should be applying and have been applying to documentary films about the Holocaust, to video testimonies of the Holocaust, to voters' audio testimonies of the Holocaust, to people who say, I don't like this methodology, this is, this is editing, you're editing out the story that I want to tell. So I, I guess I would just suggest that this is nothing new and that these are concerns that we could apply not only to the NDT but to also to a larger lineage of testimony. So my response is, he's a pedagogical agent. Just like he's not an actual teacher, but he takes on sort of the role at, in certain instances of what a teacher would do. I mean, I'm, it seems like there's a certain, like back to the notion of like, you know, ontology and the use of language here. It seems like there's a, 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 a grasping for a notion of testimony that, that is, this is different but yet it's still connected to that. Just like it's a pedagogic agent and it doesn't supplant a teacher, it augments a teacher, it possibly substitutes for a teacher in certain moments where there needs to be an embodied teacher who's not actually physically present, but it doesn't replicate that, but it is linked to that um, directly through its functional structure. And I sort of see, I mean, that's why we said embodied archive, right? It's, it's, it's a we database, call it, but it's- call it embodied documentary, as we explained well, the idea. Embodied documentary or even database. I mean, and there, there's this argument, has the archive simply become a database? Database, and obviously some of the presentations dealt with that also. But you know, a database is not an archive. An archive is not a database. There are two separate things, but they're linked. And I see this sort of, the, you know, I see what Pincus Guter is doing in, the, in actually that agency sense as being a pedagogical agent, which is, you know, that's a great term, but you can think of other terms that would fit. Um, but he's not a teacher, but he does do 
in certain settings, what a teacher would do, but not the same as a teacher. And, I, and I, there's all these distinctions I draw about that. And I think it's really important that that's something that's understood is you can change something, but still have a link to that original or authentic moment that somehow we, we, we privilege. I'm not quite sure if this answers any of the questions, but I do, <laughs> I do want to say that um, sometimes we might present it as we walk in with this list of questions that we have to get in this order and that's what we're going to do. 99.9% uh, .9 of the time that is not what happens at all. The, the week of the interview, the person in control is the survivor. So we, we go in and it's about 12 of us on set with the survivor. We've all already met them. We know them really well. This is what I, th I think you mentioned, if we know all the answers, why are we asking the questions? That's what Steven yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what Steven was trying to point to is that we try and build up a level of trust with each of the survivors so that they feel comfortable with all the questions that we're going to ask them. Um, but, Sometimes we might start with a handful of questions, and those aren't the questions that they want to answer in the moment. So we have to find a different approach. Uh, sometimes we might go in and we find out that 20 questions that we came up with because we watched an interview from 20 years ago, completely irrelevant to how they're telling their story now. It, this, there's no set Yes, we've created a methodology that we follow, but it's adapted to each individual. It's adapted to the people who are there on the set taking the interview. Um, it's adapted to the conversations that we've had with the survivors beforehand. Uh, the conversations that we have in the break, in between each hour of filming that we do. Um, so I think, and I forgot what I was gonna say, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think it is very much a testimony because the, the process is still very much an interview where we're asking them a question and they're giving us their, their authentic answer, their testimony, they're responding as they would uh, other places. All right, thank you very, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all of you as well for the great questions and discussion. Okay, so uh, thanks uh, to all of you who stayed with us, and I think this was a, a pretty uh, great day uh, if we uh, think about the diversity of presentations uh, throughout the day and how this all came together. So I'm uh, um, uh, pretty hopeful for tomorrow. We see each other at 9.30. Uh, the, the session starts at 9.30, but please come all a little bit earlier for the uh, uh, pastries and the coffee. And so, uh, yeah, so I would uh, uh, want to thank the panel, everybody, and uh, uh, see you tomorrow.